webinar for 2021. Uh, we, uh, we look forward to the opportunity of hearing uh, Professor Jeff Cockfield, uh, who's Honorary Professor uh, with, in the Centre for Sustainable Agricultural Systems and the Rural Economics Economy Centre of Excellence at the University of Southern Queensland based in Toowoomba. Now, a little bit of, little bit of background, Jeff, he's worked in agriculture and jour rural journalism before uh, starting an academic career at USQ. He taught uh, public policy, environmental policy and economics and held a number of leadership roles in the faculties and research centres and institutes. He was the 2018-19 Fulbright Distinguished Chair in Agriculture and Life Sciences at the Kansas State University in the United States, where he worked on a comparative study of US and Australian agricultural policy. Recent uh, research projects includes the economics of soil improvement treatments, assessing the adaptability of soil treatments and cognitive perspectives on farm business decision making. And uh, Jeff is going to uh, provide uh, a bit more detail about some of the work that he's actually done in the dairy industry, looking at, uh, looking at adoption and uh, a very pertinent uh, topic for our, uh, for our profession. So Jeff, I'll uh, hand over to you. Unmute myself and look, I do have a, a troublesome dog on hand, so I'll... Uh... You might have to ignore an occasional bit of background news. Um, thanks very much. And uh, I'm just going to talk to you today about some uh, research we've did, done a while ago. And I actually see I'm joined by one of my collaborators, Peter Gaffey, down there in uh, the Western District. Uh, welcome, Peter. We'll talk a bit of dairy stuff in a, in a minute. And what I'm wanting to talk about today is approaches to extension when we consider the, uh, the more sort of cognitive um, types of analysis of, of behavior and responses. And I don't think anything I'm going to say today about uh, what we found and what we might do about it as any great surprise to experienced extension people. So I'm not claiming uh, great new discoveries or insights into uh, agricultural extension. But what I hope to do is provide a bit of a framework that might help us think about this. And secondarily, uh, start to think about how we might develop our, our extension strategies and policies. So I'm now going to, uh, with this presentation, I'm going to pretty quickly skip through some of the introductory background and detail uh, to try and make plenty of time for the substantial findings and the questions. And this presentation is available for you to go through the details uh, later on. Oops, I needed to share my thing share my screen before I do that, sorry. Share. Okay. okay, so that's the topic as advertised and I'll just explain a little bit about uh, why, we're, why we were looking at this and it was a sort of an industry demand, but I think there is a general issue and it's really about the rate at which people adopt all this wonderful research that is done and all of the decision support systems that are developed. Uh, why don't as many people change their practices and adopt our good ideas as we would hope? That means a lot of money is spent. That also means from our point of view, I think that we're concerned about the non-adoption uh, for the people's own sake is because they might not be changing uh, sufficient to keep up with those adaptation pressures that are out there. Uh, and we need to make good use of, of our limited resources as well. So we're looking at two studies um, uh, put together. One, one does follow the other. One was around feed base. One was more focused on farm business management. Um, and the two problems, again, were about non-adoption. So that was the sort of unifying theme there. Underperformance on feed production. And that's how I came to work with Pete down in the Western District and also in Gippsland and Northern Victoria. And then the second one was largely undertaken across the New South Wales uh, dairy areas as well. And we had some problem foci, mainly to do with barriers to participation or barriers to adoption. We used interviews with advisors, service providers and so on. 
Uh, and uh, we, we got some pretty good samples all together, but the first one in particular, you know, being able to get to 153 producers is a pretty good uh, uh, research project nowadays. Now, uh, the sort of frameworks that we started with here are very strongly around uh, behavioural approaches, looking especially at uh, heuristics and how we process ideas. And look, I'll, I'll stake out my colours. I'm very much in the camp that uh, there are limits to sort of rational decision making. Uh, I could probably say it a bit more strongly than that, but I think I'll leave it at that for the moment. We're very cognizant of social and occupational identities, subcultures and learning styles as well. And the way we structured these a little bit was to say, okay, what would be the ideal model of decision making in which we assumed that people were reflective and evidence-based and had time and space to sort of uh, consider the evidential approach that we use to persuade them. Uh, and then let's look at the departures from that. And it's a bit of an unfair straw person type of uh, comparison we're doing there, um, because you know we all know that that's not the case, but it serves as an anchor point and we can examine um, those differences there. So uh, typically we ask people about their farm, their farm, farm history and background, and then asked a series of specific questions. Um, there was nothing too uh, unusual or radical about the structure of those. Really, the effort was in, in embedding those assumptions we made or those frameworks we made um, related to people's decision making and also in um, how we might analyse the themes and so on. So some key findings from those. And again, I don't think we're going to get any surprises here. Uh, in regard to feed management, the advisors and researchers we spoke to see the problem of uh, feed production under performance on farms. We could do better. But when we ask farmers, they do not see the potential or need for vast improvements on their own farms. They'll generally acknowledge that there, there's a bit of a could do better in our district and maybe I could do a bit better, but no great concern about the feed base gap, which was how industry people put that. Farm business, uh, you know, the advisors again saw big deficiencies. Farmers acknowledge the importance of farm business management, acknowledge that it should have importance in their own business, but also acknowledge that it's not matched by their actual priority. And again, look, we all know that they have a strong preference for the operational side of things, generally speaking, and with some exceptions, and farm business slips down the order there. And look, we also observe very strongly in all these interviews, the predominance of what's called nat uh, naturalistic management. And here you see our, our sort of anchor point, the rational technical farmer, a, an ideal model. And then we saw what, what, uh, what we saw in the field is on the other side of it over here. And look, there is, there's almost no formal use of economic analysis. It's a rare and occasional thing and, and really, confined to fairly major business decisions. More so, there's not even or often a clear business plan or um, understood goals, and there can be differences in opinion about what goals are when you ask different participants in the business. Uh, formal meetings and so on are coming into play, but incidental communication predominates. Financial management is largely confined to the simple book uh, keeping strong tax and bank focus, et cetera. And when we look uh, for say feed budgets, the planning based on feed budgets has an indicator of a, of a sort of a, a strategy, that, a, a sort of a predictable strategy, very, very little use of that as well. Uh, grazing rotation plans were sort of uh, a good bit better, but often vaguely articulated. Uh, moisture sensors, which is, you know, you could argue would be critical to very efficient water use. Uh, well, there's lots of unused ones lying around in paddocks. I could tell you that that is for sure. So that's that issue of disadoption. You know, something is adopted and then it's not really used as we go forward. And again, you know, we can go through all of those, but, it, but the story is quite clear that heuristics, rules of thumb predominate, and there's some uh, logical reasons why that is the case. Very little use of decision support tools there. And of course, uh, this one was my favourite, which came out of it. And when we asked people about, 
you know, how they might decide on whether they need to change grazing rotation and how their feed uh, quantity is going. We've got here the sort of formal pasture measurements in this corner and this corner, but what do they use? Well, they use eyes, the depth of grass on the boots, and uh, one, the one that I really liked was how quickly the cows ran, in, ran into the uh, feed area as well. The clanging of the gate gives it away. So you can see, you know, in a light-hearted way, uh, that really summed up for me some of the issues that we'd found more formally. So why don't people change towards, uh, you know, what are recommended practices? And look, the, these are a really a list that you'd find. I won't go through all of them, but it's the money, it's the season, it's how much time and labour they have available. Uh, might be policy uncertainty around things like water. The farm layout is important as well. It can be sometimes difficult to adopt things when you've inherited a certain uh, layout as well. Um, some people are very self-reliant in their gathering and processing of information. So they're not necessarily strongly directly open to uh, industry influence. Stage of life is important. Like why are you, you know, you, you've sort of uh, done most of your career and why would you then be uh, doing other things that require time and effort and for you to switch as well. I think an important one is to think about the growth stages of business. So are we in consolidation? Are we in expansion? Are we in debt reduction? And so on and so forth. And a huge, huge one um, that doesn't happen on every farm, but can be actually disastrous, the effects of succession. But the plus, on the plus side, and this is a point I want to really get across, is thinking about strategic points of intervention, is there are drivers. So why do people make changes? And the flip side of tough years can be that people actually reflect on what they're doing. Um, they look at market systems and say, we have to change. They think about the future and think, yeah, there is a future in the dairy industry, let's go and so on. Generational change is a big driver. Someone comes in and there's not only new ideas, but there's kind of pressure to make the business produce more to cover more people and so on. Uh, what other farmers do, very important. And very important because even though I'm arguing that we're not necessarily big on, on rational decision making. Education, training and exposure to other ideas are still extremely important within that. And I'll talk more about that. And benchmarking, you know, through, through looking at what other people do and comparing is also influential. Not for everyone, but it is that. So I guess what I want to say is lot, lots of barriers to change, but there are things which open up opportunities. And if we are familiar with the situation that uh, farm business are in, then kinds of helpful intervention become more possible. Uh, farm business management we're looking at here is uh, what, do, what drives attention to farm business management. Consultants have a view that it's pressure, deregulation and so on. Um, marital relationship changes and breakdowns they see as a big one. Uh, but farmers see or revealed, I guess, not so much see but revealed that it's about the stage of business. Is it a farm that has task specialization so someone can focus on the business? Uh, is it a growth business in which case more analysis is needed? Who are our peers and our networks that influence us in that one? Uh, people, there's not a big number of people, but it was notable that people who came into the dairy industry from other industries, particularly sort of big managerial type industries, they do often have a different approach to analysis and evidence and uh, planning and so on. And succession we talked about before, but also those learning experiences. It does, you know, there are, there are sort of light bulb moments when dairy farmers go and look at cotton farmers in relation to their water use practices and so on. Those are very, very important in my view. What we then did was look at how do people decide in their decisions around major investment. Um, and it isn't net present value. I could tell you that it isn't net present value. The priority things are how farmers see the manageability of the system. Will it be more manageable? Will I be at the right size? And, and plenty of our farmers, you know, they go up a bit and down a bit to sort of find the right size in terms of cow numbers and area and so on. 
they do use a bit of a um, uh, an economic rule of thumb, which is around time to recover the investment, although that wouldn't be quite as formal as uh, you know, um, a cost benefit type approach. Uh, you know, is someone I respect using it? Uh, what's the upfront cost? That's a huge one. It may pay in the long run, but that initial large expenditure is a significant barrier. So have they got the money? How the farm looks in the future? And one big one, which is a difficulty is, does it mean I have to employ more labour? And that is a big barrier for some people who do not really like to manage people very much. There are notable exceptions, but that is one. Uh, and interestingly, in formal economics, we talk about the value of the land and the return on that as part of the asset. That's, that's a rare thought amongst the farmers we spoke to. Land is the base for farming. And then you see if you make the enterprise pay as well. well if we look at sort of technical innovations such as, you know, um, uh, tracking collars for cows or heat collars for cows, whatever the case may be, you know, they look at long, long run money saving, labor saving, does it work in our area? And do I like the technology? That's important as well. So, you know, personal attachment to things can help with innovation. Uh, and operational things like, you know, the buying feed and so on, it's we want to avoid stagnation, more gut feel, cash availability, and greater use of intuition and so on. So if we look at the indicators around business that farmers use, very strongly cash flow, ability to meet bills, costs, for, and particularly for signature items, and profit. But I, I doubt that profit is quite as techni technically uh, defined as economists would have it and so on. So again, you know, the rules of thumb, I think, are kicking in there as well. So why would people participate in uh, industry training? Quality and reputation of presenters is very, very strong. And I'll say something qualified to qualify that as, as an issue a bit later on. Uh, seeing farms and farmers. So, you know, the paddock experience. And I know there's that issue of, in designing extension of, look, we, you know, they do want to look at a farm, but we want them to look at the board as well. So that balance is a very difficult one to get together. Um, the social aspects are important. Um, sometimes, you know, a particular central tool can be useful in, in getting people engaged. And this is a big one, proximity. Where are things held? Like there's, it varies across the regions but there is, a, there is a travel bubble that applies in terms of what people will attend and contact and so on there. Uh, this one is important. Industry folks in the dairy industry say, there are general principles you can apply everywhere. Dairy farmers will say, this district is different to that district and so therefore different things apply. That is an important difference, I think, in terms of how things are pitched and where they are held. So gathering all that data, let's just return to how we started to think about some of the observations that we drew out. We're relying heavily on Daniel Kahneman's work, the idea of fast and slow thinking, and the idea that generally the fast thinking is rapid, intuitive and dominant, and we use lots of heuristics and approximations. And slow thinking, which is really what a lot of research systems are based on, requiring people to be reflective, evidence-based. I think that takes a lot of effort. You're, you're busy out there on the farm. You have many things to uh, deal with. And we're saying, we, the research industry are saying, you know, stop and listen to my great idea and here I'll prove to you why it's good for you. And these uh, tendencies are supported by an array of empirical studies uh, as well, which I'm not going into, but they are quite interesting. But if we look at the dairy context, and I think probably the context of many other farms, there'd be some variation, you know, between say crop and beef, large scale beef grazing and so on. But we're looking at a high intensity task and decision environment. Long days, tied, strongly tied to the operational side, multiple markets. And so what could we expect but a proliferation of decision shortcuts and rules of thumb? And that's what we saw and you can see it in the context when you ask people about 
uh, when they might read or when they might reflect on things or when they might do their books and so on. You can see that. Also important are the social factors around social identities very, very strongly. And this might again vary from industry to industry and region to region. But what do farmers in our region and industry think and do? You know, that's a very, um, that, that creates its own boundaries there as well. And how people define themselves, like I am a grass farmer or I am a milk farmer. You know, I like the cows or I like the paddock, whatever. People define themselves in uh, very important ways. So the farm system is, is also tied to how people see themselves. So changing a farm production system means you're starting to challenge or change someone's identity as they see it. And this is especially the case if they're changing towards uh, practices that are adopted by some group that are considered a bit out there, that are considered not in the mainstream, you have that there. And let's not, of course, forget family and culturation. So, you know, uh, ideas, good or bad, are passed down from generation to generation. And so, you know, quite understandably, intuitive management is the default approach. And it's important to note that it is very, very functional. You know, there's been medical studies done on people who've had various kinds of brain injuries or interventions, and they, they cannot do intuitive management, but they are stuck with deliberation. It's completely paralyzing of their lives. So we cannot, we cannot have people doing this all the time. And it's important to think, you know, farmers have many things to do. Researchers have two or three things they're focusing on that they want the farmer to do. But there's 20 of us telling them here is a good idea, here is a different good idea that they need to process. So intuitive management is very, very functional. But the problem is it's, it, it can create these path dependencies. It can get inaccurate over time. You can miss important innovations. And it brings with it, when you get comfortable with it, problems of overconfidence. You, you think, yeah, look, I'm pretty good at estimating pasture, uh, pasture densities and amounts. Uh, I don't really need training and so on. But you've actually forgotten some of things and your judgment has slipped over time. You can read through these, but there's a number of, of uh, kind of uh, cognitive effects that have been well observed and studied that affect the evaluation of information uh, financial decision making, the resistance to new ideas, this is a very important one, and communications effects that influence how we hear messages. I urge you to sort of briefly read through those at your leisure, but let me sum it up. We're not very good intuitive scientists. We're pretty inaccurate. We're not very good statisticians, and we're particularly not good around probabilities and risk, and we're not very good intuitive economists. Emotion is highly influential. We're not utility maximizers, as the market uh, analysis would suggest. Um, and positions and practices once formed can be very hard to overturn. We have all these automatic defense mechanisms that spring into action when what we're doing is being challenged. We all know that. You know, everyone sat in uh, lectures and had their dearest idea challenged and straight away you start to generate the reasons why that person is wrong. So that's important. So implications and recommendations. Oops, sorry. Let me just go back. Sorry. Well, just reinforcing some of the points I've already made, that we have some incompatibility around our paradigms, the way researchers work, the training they have, the focus they have, versus the farm context and the farm background. So. That's, that's the first thing. And, but if we look at some of the decision-making models and we have these things that feed, feed into in, intuition that then feeds into managerial ability and implementation managerial ability, what are the things that we can affect if we're talking from an extension thing? Uh, we can't do much about a person's intelligence and we have limited impact on their experience. We have some, but limited impact. But what we can do is encourage reflection, 
we can encourage observation of their own system, we can build technical knowledge, we can help them reflect on their own objectives, uh, we can help them understand decision theory in another, in a, in a accessible way. And what I'm talking about here is starting to think about acknowledging the way people make decisions rather than pretending that it doesn't happen when we all know that it does. And we can influence their management style to some extent, and we can help them work with the feedback. So there are things we can do that contribute to strengthening intuition, not working against it necessarily, or at least incorporating into more reflective thinking. And we can think about those times that I started to talk about before where we can encourage that reflective thinking. Um, when, when there are crises or family decisions, which can work the other way and be paralyzing, using what peers are doing and saying, working through consultants and so on, um, you know, getting people who come from outside industry training and so on. So all of those things, there are opportunities for influencing the reflective thinking, getting people to think about what they're doing and the system they're operating. Now, advisors, you'll be pleased to know, are very influential, but this kind of patchy use of them, ranging from integral part of the business to occasionally being brought in. And we observed a number of farm businesses that grow out of them. That's that sort of disadoption thing. Use, use an advisor for a while, then you think, oh, I got the hang of it now, and you know, I don't want to spare the cash, so I'll do that. Oh, we've come up to a bit of a crisis, we'll get someone back in. So that usage can be quite patchy. And what I observed uh, is that sometimes the influence of advisors is like joining a team or a club. Some might almost say cult in <laughs> things. And I think there are some issues around that. They're highly influential, but something about many of the advisors we spoke to is they don't use industry research very directly. More often they recycle the practices of what they see as top farmers. So when we're pushing uh, our research out there and think we know farmers are busy and use that intuitive management, so let's get to their advisors. Well, we probably need to be sure the advisors are taking up research as well. And if not, have a bit of a think about that. So what, what, what might we do to help with the extension uh, systems? Well, relationships, relationships, relationships. You know, it's about that trust. Again, look, we've known that since 1970s, uh, you know, extension sociology. But this only reinforces that sl slightly from another direction because it's about um, who do people listen to and the influence of people who talk directly to them. Use simple and several financial indicators in, in mounting a case. Uh, trying to work with the business and life stages of farmers. Um, describing the impact on system manageability. So not only does it pay, how will your system look when you make this change? Work on redefining uh, accompanying social and work identities. You know, start talking about them as you are this kind of farmer or this is part of being a good farmer or whatever the case may be. And use that peer pressure and benchmarking discussion groups, functional discussion groups are terrific, not for everyone. Some people's personalities aren't suited, but they are a terrific uh, method of, you know, upping the ante a bit. And coordinated knowledge transfer. So, you know, think about how it's done kind of across the industry and using known presenters, but we need to also think about how we introduce new perspectives and those future industry heavyweights as well, because there, there could be a gap there. For, and whiteboard and paddock together, again, that old one. Uh, at the industry level, as sometimes we need basic skills. This particularly refers to business management before we go to the higher level campaigns. So make sure we've got some foundations uh, before we get up there. Communication that's based on, you know, memorable events, metaphors, other farmers, and so on. Uh, informal benchmarking, we've talked about the importance of lighthouse projects, seeing what someone is doing, the over the fence effect, and strategies that lift people out of their industry and locale to see other situations. All of those things work there. 
coordinated industry messaging. And again, Peter will know this, you know, we had a discussion about how cluttered the extension landscape can be with private business, government, you know, particular campaigns and so on. Pick some things within a period of time and focus on those. We have to also manage funders and providers expectations. And this was evident. Funders want us to intervene and convert people, conduct a program, people will be changed, let's move on to the next issue. It is not a conversion process. You cannot do a conversion process in one hit. Lifelong learning we're talking about here and uh, also coming back to reinforce messages and approaches that were learnt in an earlier period because of that maladoption, disadoption, cognitive drift and so on. Think about how much money is spent on decision support tools and think very carefully about likely effect and you need multiple communication pathways. Surprisingly, you cannot guess as to what types of people use what types of communication pathways. It's not all the young will have social media. So we need to be very, very multi-strand in that. So the limitations to this research are, you know, I have to acknowledge that the theoretical base has been subject to considerable challenge. Um, people will say behavioral experiments are not real world. Uh, reflective thinking may increase with bigger decisions. So say we're buying a farm, we might spend more uh, time or building a shed, we might spend more time on it. Um, in our, as in all agricultural research, you end up with skewed samples. Although I have to say our, um, our partners made a terrific effort to reach beyond uh, the usual suspects. Uh, findings may be particular to industry and regions. I might find, you know, there's lots of slow thinkers and reflective thinkers in the cotton industry, for example. I don't think that's necessarily the case. I think we are looking at universal tendencies, but with some industry differences. And some people argue that it'll change over time with education and exposure to ideas. Again, maybe, but I'm not sure how much those changes are important. Okay, so uh, I have two reports that are freely available and also this presentation that can come to you through APEN or you can, uh, I'm easy to find through my USQ affiliation and I'm happy to send stuff to people. I'm also happy to talk to other people uh, who may have groups or interests uh, that because I'd really like to have further discussion on this. Thanks, Grant. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks very much, Jeff. Um, I'm sure there may be uh, maybe some questions. So I must admit I haven't been keeping an eye on the chat to see if there are any put in there. But are there any questions that people have? You can uh, go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, and ask the question. Um, Hopefully there are some. I had one earlier and I've it slipped my memory what it was, but I look forward to any questions that we might actually have. Hi Jeff, I have a question. My name's Justine. Um, has any of your work um, dealt with uh, moving towards organic or credentialed um, change? Because that's a big change that may become a large consumer demand. I'm asking because I'm working with um, AWRI and I'm a Masters of Business, uh, Agricultural Business student at Melbourne Uni, as well as running a wine industry business myself, so. Yeah, um, it's a good question. And um, what we did get into that a little bit, and it was mainly related to when we discussed people's goals and how, the, how they saw the farms in the future. And so then organics would come into discussion there. Um, we look, it's a small number, so I'd be careful about making any generalizations from it, but it did seem there was often a generational change effect uh, related to that, um, with perhaps, you know, the, uh, some of the younger generations a bit more open to that. Although certainly, uh, you know, plenty of people my age were also, you know, happy to go along with that idea. One of the drivers appeared to be, um, uh, you know, as they saw it, the inputs, cost and amount getting out of hand. I also meant to say sustainability, sorry. So that's the broader one, but yes, but thank you. Yeah, I have to say, um, 
we did not really get much discussion of the idea of sustainability or natural resource management uh, in our interviews. I have to say that was a very background issue. Or well, those were very background issues. Very good. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. We got other questions from uh, from the audience. We've got a number of people on here. I think we have an online one from Heather. Oh, we do. Sorry. Yes. Who asks me uh, of all the of all the extension programs you've observed or come across, is there one that you think is most effective? That is a very good question. A, though a big question. I suppose I'd say something about what I learned from my uh, Kansas experience. And I think, and then putting together with uh, the sort of history of Australia, and we have to be careful because like we can't replicate the Midwest extension system in Australia, simply because probably the, I would say dismantling, but let's say disaggregation of that has probably gone a bit, a bit too far. And I don't see any time soon that we'll get back to that. But I think the key things for me were uh, I was very impressed in the Midwest areas with the connection of universities to the extension system. So the universities employed researchers and they employed specialist extension people and their connectivity to their region was extremely strong. Those people expected to see Kansas State people in their purple uh, coming out and doing stuff. Uh, and on topics including, you know, here's, here's a market analysis for this season, here is what you should do with your support programs and so on. So I think a more, a, a sort of firmer structure with some strong nodes of uh, extension that crossed, where, where that system crossed state borders, I think, but, but had both uh, state and federal uh, and NRM participation would be good. I think I was impressed with the consolidation they had so that NRM and rural development all sat with agricultural extension. And I think we have a case in Australia for a greater consolidation of the disaggregated bit. So why don't NRMs and local governments and DPI types all sit together in, in those smaller regional areas? Even informal collaboration would improve as a result of that. So I think I look, I could I won't go too far down this path, Heather, because I do have quite a few views about that. But I think there it's around strengthening networks and consolidations, sharing space, and at the top level, planning our priorities in terms of industry influence. So let's pick something for the next two years, two or three things then move on to some other things as priorities. And we have another question there too, Jeff, on the, on the chat. Um, Ajal has asked a question, uh, marrying whiteboard to paddocks in the online learning space and a question mark. While paddock learning might be preferred for most online learning offers more accessibility. And how do we find the balance? And yeah. What has your experience been? So my observation of, um, uh, we, we didn't have a lot of examples to look at, but what I concluded from our studies was, um, and, and think back to that point about the importance of relationships, is very, very important when you're starting out with any kind of engagement or influence strategy that there is personal contact. So what I would say is get them in the paddock, then get them in the paddock and the whiteboard, and then have a structure that follows up with online delivery and then there is occasional uh, getting back together in person. So I think, I think the integration of the system is where we're headed into the future. That does both the sort of resources, but I think if you jump straight to the online, uh, unless there is a clear connection between presenters and important program organizers and you know, a good chunk of, the, of that uh, industry, industry people, then I think you've missed a step in there. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, oh, another com uh, question here. Christine uh, has asked, how important do you think compliance and regulation is in motivating or creating barriers to adoption? And for example, uh, she's listed, of course, animal welfare, biosecurity, food security. Yeah, so um, 
compliance measures requirements are used very much in Europe and North America alongside, you know, the various um, programs. One of the problems in Australia is we actually don't have much leverage in the same way as they do because we don't directly give too much to farmers. Mm. And so, you know, uh, like we can't even, again, comparing to the Midwest, you might think the US is the home of the free and, you know, we don't want government interfering with us and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> Let me tell you, that's, that's a load of hot air. Um, they actually have all kinds of arrangements that allow them to collect terrific statistics terrific and detailed statistics in, in many regions. We don't even have that. Why, why would people provide uh, stats and information to our, um, you know, ABS or ABS or whatever? So the leverage is important. Sure, you know, compliance is important in terms of adoption where, you know, we talk about animal health practices and other things. So that, and well, animal welfare and so on, people do that. Uh, and it is true that compliance can lead, so that changes of attitude can follow compliance, if you like. You do it because it's a regulation and you can come to say, okay, well, you know, things are running better. But I think uh, we are a bit limited in terms of the levers we have on that one. Thanks, thanks for that, Jeff. Um, I'm looking for any other questions that might be coming through. Um, I'll uh, just Mary make, oh, sorry, thanks, Mary I've got a question. Thanks, Jeff. Um, as extension people and researchers, um, how do you get people to suspend their beliefs about this is the best thing since sliced bread and you should be doing yeah. it? And yeah. actually try and get people to say, look, it's their choice, it's their decision. And all you can try and do is influence that. Um, yeah. Rather than say you should be doing this, or you should be doing, it, and you're an idiot if you're not doing it. So how do yeah. we get over that thinking of the people who are trying to um, sell it? Yeah, and often, I mean, my experience is that that's more attitude that you see further up in the you know the extension network. I think that's less the attitude where people are a kind of frontline extension people. But I think there are, there are three, three aspects that I'd be looking at there. Uh, one is I would actually make industry folks, uh, research and extension folks, very aware of the degree of non-adoption that occurs. Like, I think we have to smack them in the face with the reality that there's a whole lot of work going on, a whole lot of money being spent that has at least to date gone nowhere. So I think that's, that's the first step that I would take. And I guess some of what I'm on about is really trying to say that as well. Second, I would start getting, in, getting people into a discussion about this is how people make decisions. And this is why, and it's very understandable. You know, intuitive management is not wrong. It is the reality and it's understandable why they do it. So you have to work with it, not against it. And then third, I think that, system, that systemic argument I put earlier, talking about how we've got two paradigms going here and you in your private life don't act like this rational person. It's just that you do to some extent in your public life in terms that you, you focus on something and present evidence and so on. And then you were, uh, but, you know, but you're expecting someone to behave differently to what most of us do. That is, that is patently ridiculous. And so I think it's that if we can get people to acknowledge what's going on, then start to work with, not against the reality of, you know, normal cognitive behavior. Thanks, Jeff, for that. Have we any other questions? Uh, I think our plan was to wrap this up after 45 minutes. We're nearly there now. Got a raised um, hand. Oh, have we? Oh, should be looking Roy. at you now. <laughs> yes, Roy. Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Jeff. I, I think what you said is excellent. I think you shouldn't put yourself down about cognitive stuff. The, the last, um, 2017 and 2019, the uh, Nobel Prizes for Economics have been from behavioural economists, not to mention Kahneman having got one himself. So I, I think the, the thing is saying, but what I'd like you to expand on 
is, is the I you know is the the principle often in my view and but whether you agree is that a lot of the reasons things aren't adopted is they weren't developed in a way yeah. that makes them suitable for farmers and many farmers to adopt. So in, often we say, oh, only twenty percent adopted, but often it may be you know <laughs> suited to forty percent. So have you got any comments on that sort of issue? Yeah, well, look, we really have to look. I, I think some of the next stage of, of social research uh, is, is to do with, um, sorry, I just, sorry, I just lost my uh, view there for a second, uh, is to do, I think, with moving from sort of survey-based thinking and interview-based thinking to more anthropological type studies where we actually look at people in their work environment and, and think about what, if I'm sort of developing this uh, innovation for people, or if I'm developing this app or this decision support system, where would it fit in people's work week? And let me give you an example of that. So we develop computer-based um, uh, decision support systems. And then let's look at that. Look, look at our dairy farmers working away out there. Uh, they have a long day. That, that whole day is not necessarily flat out, but because of the milking things, it's a long day. Uh, and when they come in uh, at lunchtime, they don't go on the computer. They might do a bit of social media or they might read a journal and there's some information there. And then at night, when they might sort of fire up the, the, um, uh, you know, the computer, like they have a long physical day and then we're expecting them to do something co cognitively taxing, cognitively and physically taxing at the end of the day or somewhere squeeze it in. It's just not going to happen. So what works? What works is things like, you know, what's a simple app that I can use when I'm out in the paddock to do my grass measure or my, you know, check water, uh, check moisture levels or whatever the case may be. Those will be adopted. Something that fits within the actual uh, work week and I think that would be an important uh, uh, development. Thanks, Jeff. Um, yeah, there's a few other comments coming in through there as well too. There's a uh, uh, mention there of the adopt tool, which you'd be yep. familiar with as well. Um, but I guess, uh, I guess my perspective, I, I think it's really important. I think to me, and this is, um, the most important thing is relationships. I think in extension, that's, that's, that's my belief. And there's yeah. my beliefs is that if you haven't developed the relationships with agribusiness, with farmers, with uh, consultants, uh, with researchers, then um, you're really on a hiding to nothing. Um, so I think that's uh, really, really got to develop relationships and, and, and get a good understanding of what, what it is like for the farm, if we're talking about the farm specifically adopting something, what, what, how, how do things fit for them? What, 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 what's their priorities? Um, that's, that's really important. Yeah. That's my comment, not a question. <laughs> oh no, we're, uh, you know, we evolved as group animals and, um, you know, in a face-to-face -face environment and uh, that, that being able to see people and get, trust people. And that's probably reinforced in rural areas where like there's rural subcultures in which that trust and, and getting used to people. I mean, everyone who's, who's de who deals with farmers know when you come into a district, you're the new person, they test you out. They want to see if you know something, if you listen, if you sort of fair income about their things. And you know, sometimes you get a bit of a hard time, but we all know that's, that's the process of, of building that trust and that's a very important process. Yeah, thanks Jeff, that's great. I don't think I've got any others. Uh, I'm looking for hands up and for questions and I'm not seeing any right there at the moment. There's a number of thanks there from people. Uh, as I as was alluded to earlier and Jeff's mentioned, um, he has got uh, this presentation and also uh, the reports will be made available through the APEN site. So please look forward to that. Um, again, I think we might, uh, we might pull it up. Uh, as I said, we're trying to uh, stick on about 45 minutes or so with these, uh, with these sessions. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for your participation today. Uh, and I'd particularly like to thank Jeff 
for uh, his, uh, his presentation. I saw this uh, a few months ago uh, up in Queensland when he presented to the DAF extension uh, community. I felt it was a very, uh, very worthwhile presentation for people in APEN to have a look at. And I think it's well worth uh, following up further with Jeff into the future. So thanks again, Jeff, for your input. Thanks again, Ro, Curry, for keeping us on the straight and narrow and getting the advertising out right this time, unlike last time when I, I got that wrong. Um, so we've got to make sure we, uh, we do uh, provide support to our membership. And uh, this is one of, the, one of the benefits of being a member of APAN is access to uh, these types of webinars. So if you have any ideas about future webinars or, or presenters that you'd like to actually present, um, please feel free to drop Ro Curry a line. Um, we look forward to seeing that because we're always looking for, uh, for new ideas. And once again, thanks very much, Jeff. Much appreciated. We'll thanks catch for, you up with you all later. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity, Graham, and thanks for people for uh, tuning in. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. I'll hang around.